Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to Let's Study the Word. It is a privilege and an honor that I'm back in your homes one more time. I'm your host, Minister Dr. Karen Powell, and I know tonight we have a word from the Lord. So one more time, we go into the word to get, you got it, a word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your mercy, for your grace that is renewed every morning. Lord, for this word, mighty God, that we have received tonight, Lord, we are so grateful. We are just sitting with our cups lifted up, mighty God, because we know we have an expectant spirit to hear what the Lord has to say to us. Thank you, God, for everything you have done and continue to do in our lives, for all that you are standing in us to do. We make ourselves ready and available. Lord, have thine own way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Good evening one more time. Welcome to Let's Study the Word. And tonight, I have a word that I am looking forward to share because it's a word I firmly believe in. And to put a topic to tonight's message, it's called Gratitude is a Must. <laughs> That's the topic for tonight. Gratitude is a must. And our scripture is taken from St. Luke chapter 17. And we'll just be reading nine verses, verses 11 to 19. So I do hope you have your pens, your paper, that you have your recording device, if that's what you need. Whatever you need, I hope you have it because we're going into the word. So St. Luke chapter 17, and we're going to be starting at verse 11. And it reads thus, and it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him 10 men that were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a low voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save the stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. I want to read that verse again. Arise, go thy way, thy faith has made you whole. This topic of gratitude is a big thing for me. And let me tell you why. I think at some point in my lifetime, I recognize that as a society, our attitude towards Thanksgiving has shifted dramatically. In fact, I would dare say that an attitude of gratitude or an attitude to give thanks is no longer the order of the day for most of us. I find that our children are growing up with an attitude of expectancy that what they want, they should get. And saying thanks is not in their vocabulary. I've grown up to see children, you know, being told over the years that, you know, you look after your parents. You know, in my era, we were told that we were our parents' pension. That's no longer true. I've gone through banks as a staff member and time and time again, I see where children get access to their parents last funds to take them through their lifetime, this, this period of retirement. And instead of being there to support the parents, 
they become a, a leech. They suck the parents dry instead of giving back. We're talking about an attitude of gratitude. We're talking that gratitude is a must. Frank W. Clark said, if a fellow isn't thankful for what he got, he isn't likely to be thankful for what he's going to get. Let me say it again. If you are not thankful for what you have received already, it's unlikely that you're going to be thankful for anything more you're going to get. Which brings to the question, are we, you and I, are we grateful people who we remember to say thanks? As I mentioned, growing up, we were told, you know, you get anything, you pass anybody and they did something, you say thank you. It was expected. Somebody opened a door, somebody held a chair, somebody handed you something. It was the norm to say thank you. And even in the church, even among Christians today, I find that gratitude is lacking. I find that gratitude is no longer a good word. It's no longer a good attitude. It's not a fruit of the spirit for even us as believers. It does not matter how much the pastor gives. It does not matter how well the choir sings and pumps and give their all. Nobody cares. And if you dare not give them what they want, what they needed, then church wasn't good today or that person didn't sing well today or that message wasn't a good message today because people have this attitude of me, myself, and I. It's so easy to not be grateful. It's so easy to not confess Consider that we need to say thanks. It doesn't look like all that big a deal. I mean, life is just so busy. Things, things are always happening. Who has time to say thanks? Willie Nelson said, when I started counting my blessings, my whole life turned around. Let me say that again. When I started counting my blessings, my whole life turned around. You have an ability to look at a glass that has water in it at the halfway mark and determine whether that glass is half full or half empty. You have the ability to look at your life wherever you are right now and determine whether you have lived a life that is half full or half empty. You have the ability to look at your life and be able to say, I may not have all that I want, but God has given me what I need. You have the ability to be gratitude, grateful, to have some level of gratitude. Just yesterday, my sister and I were speaking, you know, and we have these conversations from time to time. Out of the clear blue, the Lord will drop something in our hearts. And we started talking about how cold the night had been the night before. And as we talked about it, who draw it for the quilt or who draw it for two sheets? And we were there. Our thoughts went to persons who didn't have a house. Maybe they were sleeping outside. Maybe they were sleeping on the roadside. And she started to recall someone that she drove past that morning who was sleeping on a curb wall and how they were shivering. And this was not even the coldest part of the day that we had experienced. The three o'clock hours had been so cold. And we are complaining about the fact that we didn't get this and we didn't get that. And there it is that one individual who would have done anything to have a roof over their head or a sheet to wrap them, to keep them warm. Are we being grateful for where we are? Or are we just taking what we have for granted? Are we thankful for what we have received 
or have what we or, or, or what we have received just been oh expecting God you need to do that you have a God, God you're supposed to do that and when we don't get what we want are we ungrateful in our attitude Ephesians 5 verse 10 tells us always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always does not demarcate at good points. Always does not mark when things are going well. Always is not just for the things that we want and the doors that we want responding the way we want them. Always means in every single area, in the good and in the bad. Give thanks. We give thanks because we don't know that, you know, you got up that morning and you had to turn back three or four times and you started getting annoyed. You don't know what accident you were saved from. You know, you met in an accident. Did you just give thanks and say, God, thank you that it was just the door or the front fender or the whole car, but Lord, I have my life. There's somebody who met in an accident who didn't survive. We have an attitude of gratitude. Let's look back at that scripture that we just read. Luke 17, verses 11 to 19. I want to point out a couple of things using this scripture. It says that it came to pass, he went to Jerusalem. And as he was going to Jerusalem, he passed through the middle of Samaria and Galilee. Now remember that the nation is divided as far as we're concerned in terms of historically in three parts. There is Judah, there is Samaria, and there is Galilee. And Judah represents those who are the descendants of David. These are those who are considered the true and pure Jews. These are those to whom Jesus was born. This was his legacy. The children were called the children of Abraham. The Samaritans are those children who based on where they were in, in, in the Northern and the Southern kingdom, these were they who intermarried when, when the nation of Israel was split from 12 tribes to 10 tribes and two tribes. These were they who those 10 tribes came together and they started intermarrying. That's what created the, the Samaritans. And then you had the Galileans. So here it is, Jesus is passing through, not the midst of his own, he's going to his own, but he's passing through Samaria and Galilee. And when he reached a certain village, I like the fact that they did not name the village because I want you to understand that that village represents any place you are in life. Anywhere you are, any stage of life you are, you're living in a rent house, that's your village. You're living in your first house and you're paying your mortgage, that's your village. You're on your first job, that's your village. You're in your fifth job, that's your village. You're about to enter retirement, that's your village. You are in retirement, that's your village. Wherever you are, whatever stage you're at, Jesus is coming to you. And when he's coming to you, he meets upon them 10 men. Now, 10 represents order. 10 represents law. That's why there's in commandments. 10 represents the number of fullness. And as he comes to these 10, we come to understand that these men had a condition. So in this village, this certain village, this place, wherever you are, you are one of the 10. And your 10 represents this order, this, this, this situation. And you are one of them that have a issue, a, a concern. Your leprosy may not be a leprosy of skin, but it may be a leprosy of finances. It may be a leprosy of your mental condition. It may be a spiritual leprosy. But whatever your state that you're in, you have determined in yourself, you're going to stand afar off. Remember, as these children in Jerusalem, they're expected to come close. But the Samaritans and the Galileans, 
are not of his own, so they stood afar off. Not only are they not of his own, legacy-wise, but they have a condition. So you tonight watching this program, you this morning watching this program, you may not even be a Christian. You may not even be called. But you have a condition and you're here at this place. And I'm hoping that by the end of this session, you would have met this man who is journeying and wants to have a conversation with you. He wants to come close to you. He doesn't want you afar off. He wants you near. He wants to have relationship with you. So here it is. These 10 men recognize that they have a situation. They have something in need of addressing, but they also recognize that they are not of the same lineage, they are not of the same historical background, and so they stood a distance, but they lifted what they could, which was their voice. I'm gonna pause here because there was another man who had to lift his voice. His name was Martinius, and he was under a tree and he had heard stories about this same man. And he had heard that this man could heal. In fact, he had heard stories that this man could heal blind people. And that story was very important to him because Bartimius had a similar situation. You see, Bartimius was blind and he was in need of sight. And so when he heard the healing Jesus, the Jesus who could take away blindness was passing by, Bartimius determined in himself that he was going to make a connection. And so he lifted up his voice and he started crying out. Now the people who were around him started saying, be quiet, be silent, be, just shut up. But Bartimius cried all the louder because Bartimius says, as long as I am silent, I am going to have this condition still remaining in my life. I am tired of this condition. I want a change. So if you go to the book of Mark 10, verses 46 to 52, we'll see this story that records this man who determined in himself that he wanted a connection with son of David. He says, son of David, Jesus, have pity, have mercy, look upon me, I have a need. We're talking about recognizing where we are, the village that we're in. So he shouted all the louder in spite of what people were telling him because in his village, his reputation was his blindness, but he was tired of this village. Are you tired of the place where you are at? Now, remember, I quoted Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson says, if you want more, you've got to be grateful for what you have. So if you, like Bartimius, are tired of where you are, one of the first attitudes you've got to change is your way, you, the outlook that you have. You've got to say, I am grateful that I have a voice because this voice is going to make a connection with the living savior. You've got to be grateful that you have a mouth that you can speak through. You've got to be grateful that Jesus is passing your direction. Bartimius said, son of David, because Bartimius understood that David had a connection with the lineage of Christ. And so if Jesus is a son of David, Bartimius was saying, I know who you are. I know that you are the one that we should be expecting. And if you're the one who we are expecting, then I know you have the power to do something about my circumstances. And Jesus heard and said unto him, be of good comfort. Now, understand, Jesus has not yet healed Martinius. But Jesus said to him, be of good comfort. The 
people around him who recognized that Jesus was calling Bartimaeus says to the blind man, okay, calm down, stop shouting, be of good comfort, be aware he recognizes your voice and he's calling you, get up and talk. And so the scripture tells us that Bartimaeus pulled away his garment, cast it away and rose and went to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what will you have me do? And Bartimaeus was very clear that I might receive my sight. And Jesus says to him, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his fight and followed Jesus in the way. In the way I am believing is in this way that was what Christianity was called in its early days. The way. Jesus was the one who declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father unless they come by me. So when Bartimaeus followed Jesus in the way, Bartimaeus became a Christian. I recognize in the story that Bartimaeus knew who Jesus was. But now let's go back to the scripture where we were reading earlier, which is the scripture taken from the book of St. Luke. These lepers made up of Samaritans also knew who Jesus was, but they knew him as master because they said Jesus Master, have mercy on us. They did not know him like Bartimaeus as son of David, the Messiah, but they recognized that in him there is something different. And so because they recognized there was a difference, they too called upon him. They too said, have mercy. They too lifted up their voices. And the scripture tells us in verse 14 that when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. Now, it was not strange for them to hear this because in those days, only a priest could declare you whole. Only a priest could say that you are cleansed. Only a priest could say your leprosy has been taken away. A priest operated in the role of doctors, physicians. The priest would examine your bodies and say, yes, you're clean. The Bible tells us that on their way to go to the priest, they were cleansed. On their way, they were cleansed. Now, the Greek word for cleanse is katharzo, K-A-T-H. A-R-I-Z-O. Going to ask somebody to drop that in the chat. K-A-T-H-A-R-I-Z-O. Kapiarzo. And it means to cleanse from stain and dirt. To cleanse in a moral sense. To cleanse in a Levitical sense. I want to say that again. They were made cleansed from physical stains and dirt, from a moral aptitude of wickedness and evil, and they were cleansed in a Levitical sense, meaning they were purged. On their way, they recognized all of this happening to their natural body. And when they saw it, they continued on their journey, except for one. We're talking about gratitude is a must. And this one, recognizing the change in his body, turns back and with a loud voice, he glorifies God. He glorifies God to the point where he falls on his face 
giving thanks to God. He's magnifying God. He's honoring God. He's giving to God everything in him to show God, I am so grateful. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All of that is glorifying God, giving thanks to God. I did this, I think it was two weeks ago, when we spoke about the fact that half of the Lord's prayer is about giving thanks to God. Being grateful to God. When David became king and his enemies were defeated, 2 Samuel 22 verse 49 says, David says, God, I sing praise unto you. You have exalted me above my enemies. From a violent man, you rescued me. Therefore, I will praise you forever among the nations, oh God. That word praise means I give you thanks. We're talking about acts of gratitude. David's heart is loved by God because nobody does gratitude like David. Remember in 1 Chronicles 29, when David thought about everything that God had done, David says, wealth and Honor comes from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power. David says, God, everything that I have is not about me. It's not about what I have done. It's all about you. David once said, look here, call the prophets, call the priests. He says, look here, I live in a house. I live in this big building. And God's presence, the ark, rest in a tent. David said, no man, no man, no man. I need to build God's house. God says, David, your love for me is overwhelming. I can't let you do this because blood is on your hands because you killed who you weren't to kill. You took where you weren't to take from. But I'm going to let your son build me a house. And I'm going to make you this promise. My seed, my son is going to come from your lineage. When you are grateful to God, when you want to give thanks to God, when you want to give back to God, God he feels overwhelmed. God feels compelled to do something for you. We're talking about gratitude. God, God is like that father who is sitting in that house and he has done all these wonderful things for his children. And he's grown his children into positions of power and authority. And instead of his children acting with gratitude, the child comes to him and says, give me everything no, because I want it no. It's almost like the child is saying to the father, Die and give me my inheritance now because I want to spend it now. And the son who said, you know, I'm going to stay and I'm going to do my father's bidding. And he got upset when the younger son came and the father said to him, everything I have is yours. Why is everything I have yours? Because you stayed with me. You have constantly been with me. And so everything I have now is yours. Yes, I love your brother. Yes, I've cleared a fatty car for your brother. Yes, I've welcomed your brother home. Yes, I'm happy and I rejoice for your brother because he who was dead is now alive. But everything I have is yours. That's how God reacts. That's how God gives to those who spend time with him, who gives gratitude to him, who gives time and his love to him. He gives back to you. And let me tell you this, when you give to God with a bulldozer, 
God gives to you an entire island. You think you can outgive God? I dare you. I bet you. I challenge you. Try to outgive God. So here it is. We have this leper who has come and dropped himself at the feet of Jesus and he's glorifying God and he's giving thanks to God because he who was sick, he who was a leper, he who had to stay far away is now cleansed. And God says something interesting to him. Jesus says, were they not ten? God is concerned with our attitude. What, are you, what, what did you say? You got up this morning. You didn't even take time out to say thank you, God, for life, for, for health, for, for breath, the fact that I'm not in a hospital. Instead of starting complaining about the price of rice and the price of bread and the price of electricity, did you even stop to say, God, thank you, that I have a house, that I have electricity to complain about? This evening, I heard some people saying they're paying their light bills and every day light goes away for like 11 months and yet they're billed for it anyway. For 11 hours, they have no light, yet they're getting an $11,000 light bill at the end of the month. We're talking about gratitude. You're complaining that your foot is hurting. At least you have a foot. There's somebody who feeling a scratch right now and they have no foot. It's phantom pains. You're complaining about the job. There are some women right now in Afghanistan who are being told that they may have spent 15 years working since the America took over Afghanistan in the war. But today they're told, go home, you work no more. They were in college. They were told, go home, because as a woman, you no longer can study in college. You no longer can teach in a college. As a woman, you're not to be heard. You're not to be seen. And you're complaining. I'm complaining. We complain about so many things. And there's so many things to be grateful for. So Jesus asked the question, where are those who are so ungrateful? Where are they? Where, where are they? Then Jesus says something to him. Arise, go thy way. Thy faith has made you. I want you to think about that for a second. Wasn't he cleansed in verse 17? Then verse 17 says they were cleansed. Uh, well, sorry, about verse 14, if I remember correctly. They were cleansed in verse 14, correctly. And in 17, Jesus asked the question, were not 10 cleansed? So we acknowledge that 10 were healed from the leprosy. That 10 had a change of their physical situation. But then Jesus looks at this one who returned and he says to him, arise and go thy way. Thy faith has made thou sozo, S-O-Z-O. Sozo. What does sozo mean? It means sound, saved from destruction, delivered from the penalties of messianic judgment. Let, let, me, let me start again. Saved, S A V E D, saved. S-A-F-E, sound, S-O-U-N-D, whole, W-H-O-L-E. Saved from the penalties of messianic judgment. That means you are now in alignment with God. That means you who were afar off, you who as a Samaritan had no dealings with the Christ, with the Messiah, you who should not have inherited, know our inheritors, hears and joint hears because you are no longer under the penalty of messianic judgment. You no longer are under the judgment described in Revelation. 
you are no longer punished. You are no longer headed for destruction. So while the physical may have been cleansed for 10, only one spiritually was whole. The one who was grateful was the only whole man among the 10. Let me tell you, there are a lot of wounded, broken, headed for destruction, people walking around looking for. We're talking about an attitude of gratitude. Jesus lived a life of giving thanks. Remember when he was brought the seven loaves and the fishes and he took them and he gave thanks. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and what should have only been able to feed one fed a multitude. Matthew 15. Remember when he took the bread and the wine in the Lord's Supper and he looked at it, the scripture says he gave thanks and he gave it to them. It wasn't about filling their bellies because they had eaten already, but this bread and this wine that he blessed and gave them as the last supper, this was a reminder that they were whole. Are you whole this evening? Are you complete this evening? Are you safe? Are you saved this evening? The Bible tells us that when Jesus went to Lazarus tomb, remember what he did? before he called for Lazarus. He said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know you always hear me, but so that those who are standing here may believe that you sent me. Do your thing, Lord Jesus. Do your thing, Father. Give thanks. Giving thanks opens a whole new door, a whole new dimension to where we can go. Giving thanks, can I tell you it's healing? Think about some of the most miserable people you know, and you will find that these are the most ungrateful people you also know. When you give thanks, it makes you happier, it makes you whole, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. It's life-changing. Psalm 100 tells us, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with grace. Because gratitude needs to be a must. Philippians 4, 6 tells us, be anxious over nothing, but in every situation with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Gratitude is a must. Have your situation not been changing? Then maybe you need to pray some more. Maybe you need to give thanks some more. You're on a job and staff is giving you help, well, maybe we need to say thank you some more. Maybe we need to be grateful some more. Paul says in Philippians 4, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty, and in both, I learned to give thanks. I learned to be content in any and in Every situation, Paul said, if I was hungry or I was full, I learned to give thanks. If I was in plenty or in want, I learned to do, I learned to give thanks. I can do it. Give thanks through him, his ministry. 
our prayers need to reflect our gratitude. Like this leper, we need to just fall before God even when we get what we want because our eyesight is limited, can I tell you? We think what we want is this, but what we need is something altogether different. This leper thought he needed a physical cleansing, but what he needed was a savior. This leper thought that if only my body, you know, could, could be changed, I, I, I could be all right. I could, I, could, I could be back among people. But when he got it and when his heart felt that conviction that man, this man did something. He's more than a master. He did something that nobody else but God could do. And he returned and gave thanks. God gave him more. God made him whole. Tonight, I want to encourage you. I want you to put your faith and your gratitude in God's face. Let me say that again. I want you to put your gratitude and your faith, your faith and your gratitude. I want you to mix them and mingle them. And I want you to give it to God. Because if you give to God, God will give back to you full measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. If that answers everything, sing and make music in your heart. That's what Ephesians 5, 19 says. Verse 20 says, giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of Jesus. I want to encourage you tonight that in giving thanks, you will be made whole. In giving thanks, God will make you sound. In giving thanks, just counting your blessings, name them one by one. Like Willie Nelson, your life can be turned all around. Give thanks at the very meal. You know, you're sitting in front of the food and people are looking at you because you're at the lunch table at work. Hold your head and give thanks. You're going to sleep. Give thanks. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this night. Thank you for this bed. Thank you for my family. If that's, I want to encourage us tonight that we who are called the cause of ones, may we be hallmarked by greatness. May we be known by the fruits of our spirit. May somebody just look at us and know that we are gods, that we belong to this family because of our attitude. Because in us they see reflected gratitude as we give that. I pray that as you listen this evening, something resonated with you. That you learned something that you were reminded about even one important truth. That you call up a teacher who impacted you. That you call up a mother or father who impacted you. An old boss who made a difference. And just say thanks. A friend, a sister, a brother. I want to say thanks tonight to all of my family and my friends who join me every Thursday night, even when they are tired. I want to say thanks to all of you who sit with me to go through the world. There's so many things you could do with your 40 minutes to an hour that you chose to spend it with me, I'm grateful. And until next week, I want to say thank you. I do hope that you subscribe on YouTube. The messages are uploaded on a Thursday night. We're trying still to get back on Facebook, still having problems, but we're getting there, we're getting there. And until next week, I want to say I love you. God bless you. God bless you. Blessings. God bless you.